करके अंदर Okay. All right. So I sorry about the trouble. I think we are back in good shape now. So um, this is a, a summary of what Majorana neutrinos are in one slide, because you had um, abundant description of what Majorana neutrinos are last week. I don't think that you need that I repeat all that, but I just wanted to keep a couple of ideas that I always find intriguing. The first one is that all this business about neutrinos has to do with the fact that neutrinos have no charges that uh, allow us to label them. And because they have no charges, that means that they have a degree of freedom that allows us to play with matter and antimatter. When you say antimatter, normally you're putting a label you say that an electron is a matter particle and then immediately you put a charge label on it, you say it's a negative particle. So to be an antiparticle in the case of an electron is very easy, you just reverse all the charges and in particular the electric charge is there. Say, hey, 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 reverse me. There's no way that you can make a mistake here. In the case of the neutrino, of course, there is no electric charge or for that matter any other charge that is bother bothering you. And therefore you have a degree of freedom and it's really remarkable that Majorana, uh, Ettore Majorana came up with the idea that because of that, you could always build up an antineutrino by uh, simply taking the, com the, the, the complex conjugate, right? Now, this somehow re reminds me of one of the lithographies of Esther in which one hand is throwing the other hand, right? Um, and this is basically what, this is the way that you build a neutrino. Like you build a neutrino, a bunch of random neutrino just dispensing with uh, all the other state and then just keeping up the conjugate. <clears throat> now, this we already know from the last week. And this is my one slide also to give you a recipe to build the universe, right? Uh, so that's That's kind of, Simple enough. You take Majorana neutrinos, again, notice the interesting uh, thing, the nights of both colors that complement each other. And then you take CP violation. And then here you get the universe, easy. That's about as deep as I'm going to get in theory, okay? Uh, but of course, that implies that if you're going to build the universe, somehow you are counting on a double agent. Why? Because you need a particle that is behaving as matter, then decaying into matter particles, also behaving as an antimatter, therefore decaying maybe into positrons in the original moment of the universe. But of course, every double agent has an agenda, right? And because the neutrino had an agenda, that slightly favor matter, then we are here, right? Otherwise, the antias would be here. Now, this is also a good moment to remind you that history is always written by the winners. And so the winners, which is us, call ourselves very proudly matter, right? The losers were the antimatters, of course. Now, it's also a good moment to talk about David, double agents. Actually, I'm a double agent. I am supposed to be here to lecture you on neutrino less double beta decays, but I am paying by the LHC forces to convince all to go away. So the main topic of my lecture is going to give you enough reasons to quit and not do this job and then save you the next 30 years of your life. I hope I will succeed. Uh, of course, as you can notice, nothing is written there because this is a secret. Ricardo knows about that, so we will say nothing. All right, why, why should you quit? Because what we are proposing you, what this business is asking you is to play this absurd game, double or nothing. And this is a game in which you are familiar with this game. You just play your cards against the casino. If you win, you get twice the money. Uh, if you lose, you lose everything. 
So of course, playing once may be fun. Playing two, it's okay. But as you keep playing, you're risking more and more because the probability accumulates against you, right? So imagine if I tell you that you have to play this game for the next 30 years, double or nothing. We had this discussion uh, this morning about projection or frequentist limits. This is one very nice way of saying that we have been for the last 10, 15, or 20 years of our life doing something and finding nothing. And this is what this game is about. Of course, the only reason to justify that is that the double is also extremely uh, rewarding. And perhaps one of the things that we tend not to insist too much is that discovering neutrinos double beta decay would be one of the major things that will be done by this or the next generation of particle physicists. At the level of my opinion of, of each and every of the biggest discoveries in particle physics, because you are basically saying that nature is a very, very strange thing, okay? In which you can have a particle that has both the properties of matter and antimatter. And at the same time, you are giving a rationale both for the smallness of neutrino masses, for the possible origin of the universe, the works. So the double is really double, okay? Let's agree on that. After this introduction, also, let me remark something that should be obvious for you already. You have not really think about that. The thing is that the only reason that we can do this kind of experiments is because nature is odd. Nuclear physics is odd. There is no reason why xenon should do double beta decay. Xenon is a stable gas, all right? It's a completely stable gas. He tries to decay to cesium and cannot. Oh, well, fine, but then you have this kind of funny thing of nuclear pairing, and because of nuclear pairing, you have this little slit of energies, and then you can go to barium to second order decay. It's kind of funny if you think about it, right? Actually, it's only not only funny, but sort of irrelevant. Like, all right, let's look at this thing plain face. So this is xenon that decays in 10 to the 20 years to barium, who cares, about 10 to the 20 years, which is forever, right? And the whole thing would be just a curiosity, just for you guys to have fun, look at how funny second order transitions are, except for the fact that, of course, it gives you the conditions to have something else. And if the neutrino is a Majorana particle, then you can have this funny flip of this spin. And even in the standard model, insist even in the standard model, because there will be many extensions of the standard model, all of them with Majorana neutrinos in which you can do something like this, but even in the standard model, you will end up with a transition in which you end up, you end up eating up the two neutrinos in the mass shell and producing a decay with only two electrons. Now, the interesting thing, which I'm going to come back again and again and again, is these three terms. So the reverse of the lifetime goes with something that looks innocent, case of space, then something nasty, nuclear matrix elements, square. Please notice the square. The squares are all over the place, making our life very, very, very uncomfortable. And then the effective neutrino mass, again, square. Now, effective neutrino mass is no mystery. We have neutrino oscillations, and therefore, all the neutrino mass eigenstates are going through that. If you can think, you can always think of neutrino mass like the kind of the lightest neutrino mass. And nuclear matrix elements are always dropped casually there. And we will see these are a very nasty thing. So, first of all, and this is the first exercise of the day, just for you to have fun. And, and of course, this should be immediately give me a qualitative argument why the amplitude 
of neutrino lowers the Alvira decay should be proportional to the mass, to the effective mass, and therefore the square of the amplitude, meaning the lifetime, is proportional to mass square. Give me just a qualitative argument, write it down in your notebooks, and let's discuss it in a little while, right? That should be trivial. Okay. So first exercise of the day, let's carry on. Now remember the formula, phase space, nuclear matrix elements, mass square. So here you have a kind of uh, phase space as a function of the isotopes, by the way. This probably has already been discussed in the lecture. There is a bunch of isotopes where you can do experiments. And there is an even shorter collection of isotopes where, where they you really can do experiments because the experimental conditions are favorable. Um, these are some of them. You know that kind of matrix, you know, the this is in logarithm scale, but still our phase space tends to be flat. Germanium have a little bit smaller of uh, uh, phase space. Uh, and then the nuclear matrix, but this is kind of something you can compute. You're not gonna get wrong. You just get your number and this is your number. End of the story. Now, uh, when it comes to nuclear matrix element, then the funds begin, right? Here you have a shell model, uh, uh, you have shell model, then you have uh, CPM, nuclear matrix, uh, and you can see, first of all, this beautiful error bars. And then you can see the variation between the different models. So this is the first reason why you should quit, first of all, right? So in case you don't find anything, the variation of this thing is square. Jesus Christ, all right? Values of void, maybe what? There is two, three, or the, you know, it can fly for between two and, and six, uncertainty on four times the square 16. Jesus, it looks bad. Uh, so let's, let's play with the exercises, okay? Imagine that you have established a limit for the lifetime of a given isotope, okay? Now, let's, we had this discussion, this deep discussion about whether you are frequentist of magician. Let's, let's get simple. Let's not be anything or the other. Let's be extremely simplistic. Uh, if you want to, to compute a limit, the very simplistic style, you just reverse the previous formula. You say, okay, mass square is just lifetime inverse, divided by this, right? Now, of course, um, I can assume that I have a limit here, put whatever limit you want, and then put numbers here, and then give me a value for m square. So far, I'm not pushing you too hard, right? Just make a couple of divisions. But the interesting thing is use, for instance, QRPA, the red bars, to estimate the central value and then the errors of the game. And tell me which kind of range uh, do you get for MBV? And tell me how do you feel about that? Okay? So this is the first game we want to play. We want to convince ourselves of the uncertainty related with the value of MBV uh, related with the fact that we have uncertainties on the uh, nuclear matrix elements. Okay, let's carry on. Uh, lonely, hard, sorrows. Of course, this is a reference to the Beatles, super famous, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, LP. Uh, so one of the obvious things that should be obvious for everybody but maybe let me repeat it again. So keep this thing in mind. Every time that you improve your lifetime by an order of magnitude, which means that you have been 10 years working on that experiment, at the very least, you improve your limit on M beta beta by factor three. So damn the square. I mean, damn the square. This is an experiment which is damned by the square. Okay. Um, the other point, 
is that when you do your divisions there, the nuclear matrix elements of certainty are going to hit you hard. Now, uh, one possibility is that you could do better by nuclear matrix elements, right? And one way to do better is to go and try to compute nuclear matrix elements from first principles. Now, there is a reference here to a paper that we wrote with uh, Avi, uh, the boss of this guy sitting over there. And one of the things I would love to hear uh, is that uh, if you have free times on the afternoons or any kind of little uh, hole, it would be nice to hear a discussion on the methods, summary on the method where uh, the, the modern way of computing nuclear matrix element is going on. Because this is one of the things that really the field is badly needed, okay? And uh, the new ways of computing nuclear matrix element are starting from first principles and trying to build up, maybe open a uh, really interesting field for reducing these nuclear matrix elements uncertainties. Naturally, it's not my field and I don't have the time for that. Okay, perfect. Perfect, so you heard. Perfect, so so this is one of the things I wanted to insist. Fantastic. So we, you have heard, of course, about the Majorana landscape. By the way, uh, and how do you want to get limits here? And by the way, uh, in these lectures of mine, you will hear very little about claims of uh, sensitivities. In the sense that there is a theorem that says, my sensitivity is better than your sensitivity. And the nice thing about this theorem is that it's a universal theorem. It's independent of the collaboration. So no matter in which collaboration you are, you can always make the same claim. My sensitivity is better than your sensitivity. Um, I'm not interested about sensitivities per se. I'm interested about solving the problems that we need to get there. And I think we will see quite a bit of that. But it is important that we understand the problem. And the problem to insist is going. So this, this plot I love a lot because it's, it's the usual landscape, but with probability, with position probabilities on it. So depending on where you are in the, of course, this is the, the by the way, the inverse hierarchy, you have heard on the theory too, I guess, the inverse hierarchy uh, versus the uh, normal hierarchy and how depending on the week in which you are in experimental data. Experimental data used to favor many years ago, the inverse hierarchy, then then, then all these neutrino oscillation experiment said, no, 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 really, maybe we have normal hierarchy. Now, lately, it's not obvious, changes every week. Uh, we don't know yet what the hierarchy is. Um, we actually don't have a reason to call normal order or inverse order or the other way around. What is true, however, is that, of course, life would be easy, easier if you would get a normal hierarchy, because then you could just kind of cover everything with anything between 10 to the 27 and 10 to the 28 years, depending on what the nuclear matrix element is, right? Well, if you have normal hierarchy, things get difficult, but notice that the probability distributions still favor quite a bit high values. So it's difficult, but not desperate, okay? Or as my friend Fernando Cosillo, the boss of this guy, uh, likes to say, the situation uh, is desperate, but not serious. Okay, we can live with that. It's the same thing. Imagine that you make many experiments and then in every experiment you plot the sensitivity that you get and then you traduce that to a limit. So you get, you get a density of probability and then this density of probability translates into that, which means that if you make a random experiment, notice that the one, the one idea, be, be, let me put it that way, the one 
thing that I, love, I like about Bayesian versus frequentist is that Bayesian offer the notion that the experiment that you are making is just one sample. And you can be lucky or lucky. So the only way to understand a projection is to make many imaginary experiments and then plot the density of probabilities that you get out of that. And then you know that your actual experiment has some probability to come in here. And this is the meaning that you get there. The meaning that you get there is that if you make a zillion million experiments, then uh, that would be where the uh, neutrino parameters would cluster, all right? So uh, again, uh, this is kind of what you want to do. And again, this is the numbers I want to insist. What we're going to be talking is right now we are in a few times 10 to the 26 years led by two experiments. Also very interesting because the two experiments that are leading the field are two extremes of the game. We will come to that in a second. One is legend, the other is Kamlan Zand, or and the the their approaches are completely different. But we will come to that in a second. But we are in the few times 10 to the 26 game, right? Gerda, I should say, not legend. Legend is like the analytic continuation of Gerda. Um, our, the goal of the next generation experiment, depending on what you talk to, is 10 to the 27 years. Nobody is yet there. So let's call that next generation experiments. The goal of the next to the next generation is 10 to the 28 years, right? So um, let's keep these two numbers and what these two numbers mean in, in, in mind. Now, let me... Let me ask actually how difficult it is to get to the numbers, all right? So uh, to get to these numbers, basically, uh, the general idea is very simple. You are going to build large detectors because as the lifetime increases, the probability of interaction decreases and therefore you have to put more nuclei there so have you noticed that this is the kind of thing where you play the lottery of Babylon, the lottery of the impossible. It is a probability which is almost zero versus a number which is almost infinite, right? It's absolutely absurd if you think about it, that something that has a lifetime of 10 to the 28 years when the lifetime of the universe is 10 to the 10 years, and this process can happen. And the only reason it happens is because the Avogadro number is obscenely big. Otherwise, it could be impossible. All right, so the thing is that you need to build large detectors, but actually, because the Avogadro number is so big, not so large, as a matter of fact. But then, then, then you have the radioactivity, and that's a different game. All right, let's carry on. Let me go through the numbers let me go through the basic ideas to build an ideal experiment. And let me give you one recipe that will not fail you. All right? If you can implement the recipe, we are done. So you get the automatic Nobel Prize. Uh, we make a discovery or, or get infinite sensitivity. So the simple recipe is please give me a detector with perfect energy resolution. Perfect doesn't mean almost perfect, okay? Almost perfect is Gerda, almost perfect is legend, but this is only almost perfect. Why I need perfect? Because perfect implies that I can measure the endpoint of the decay with zero width, which implies that no background can make it because I can always be more selective than the background number, which implies that I need just one event to make a discovery with no error, right? So actually, this is the only way I could make a completely guaranteed background-free experiment. Zero resolution, please, if you have a perfect idea to give me a zero resolution, let me know, all right? Now, 
In this case, it's extremely simple. You just count the events that you observe here, they all signal. And then from that, we, co we count the corresponding lifetime. Now, this is recipe number one. Now, let me give you, a, suppose that you cannot get a perfect energy resolution detector. Uh, let me give you recipe number two. Uh, give me a detector with perfect shielding. Now, here you have my own approximation to a perfect shielding detector. Actually, we published a paper on that a few years ago. Uh, imagine that you make a big, big volume, all right? And this volume you filled with normal xenon, okay? And the normal xenon is a very good calorimeter. We will see that. We'll stop the gammas, right? And then we'll stop all the radiation except the radiation of your inner volume. This is actually what Kamla Zen is doing. But the trick here is that our inner volume will be made of graphene. And graphene is basically zero background, right? And it's actually transparent to the liquid xenon scintillation light. So with this experiment that we call GRACE, uh, we had a lot of fun uh, designing the balloon with the graphene people, you would get in first approximation a perfect shielding detector. Now, a perfect shielding detector will get rid of all external background, but it will not get rid of internal backgrounds. And what is an internal background? Internal backgrounds are, for instance, of course, the two neutrino mode. You can think on that as a background or as a part of the signal, it depends, but for, for, for what you need is a background. So only perfect shielding will not do. So your perfect shielding needs, at the very least, have enough resolution to get you rid of the two neutrino mode. Now, as you go to bigger and bigger detectors, then the neutrino fog comes in. The neutrino, you start to get solar neutrino interactions, and it will not do unless you have energy resolution. And then, of course, if you have a big volume, you know, unless you are perfectly shielded from neutrons too, you will start to get activation of your xenon from neutrons. And you will get fragmentation of your xenon. And this will make it into your window. So again, the perfect shielding experiment only works if you have good enough energy resolution. So energy resolution, you never can get rid of it. All right, still, let me give you a third recipe to make a perfect, um, a perfect experiment. Now, what you know is to get yourself a detector with a perfect signal signature, all right? And here is an example of something that could look like a perfect signal signature. The signature of the neutrino less the beta decays two electrons. Suppose that you have a system that says, no, no, Always, I have always a way to detect two electrons. We'll come back to this, but let's call these two electrons as opposed to this one electron. Your neural networks can make a distinguish, can distinguish here, right? I mean, your physical neural network, your natural intelligence. Your natural intelligence can distinguish between these little two balls, right? This is a worm with two heads and a worm with one head, right? Well, an artificial neural network also will be able to do that. Suppose that this would be infallible, that you will never fail. All right, now I have a signature that says this is neutrino less than beta decay, everything else is not. So here we are fine, but of course, normal to, neut to, normal to neutrino mode also have it. So you still need the energy resolution. So by now you have got the message, right? You need the energy resolution. This Kyorini understood that, I don't know, 40 years ago, maybe. You need the energy resolution for this business. All right. Now, bad news for you guys. Perfect detectors do not exist. That's life. Uh, now, interesting enough is that because perfect detectors do not exist, real experiments need to make compromises. And actually, the, the interesting thing about neutrino-less double beta decay is that you need to make compromises 
playing with what nature gives you because you need to make a detector out of your uh, isotope. So suppose you want to study germanium. Well, hell, it's a very good luck that you can make a crystal of germanium. It's almost like nature decided to make your favor. Why in hell should it be that like that? Suppose that you want to study xenon. Well, it's almost magic that you can make a TPC out of xenon. Again, it didn't need to be like that. Same thing for molybdenum. By the way, this restricts. I mean, it looks magic. In practice, it's restricting the number of isotopes you can use. We'll come back to that in a second. In practice, because your detector is also your target, most of the times, uh, there is only so many isotopes that you can use. All right. And then all the experiments and all the experimental techniques, all of them are about trying to find a compromise between the handles. And we have seen the three handles that we have. One is energy resolution. The other one is signatures of the signal. The other one is shielding. So all the experiments in practice try to use a little bit of everything, but all of them also kind of specialize in one thing or the other. And this is what makes the approaches also very interesting. All right. Now, we can compute rates in the absence of backgrounds. Of course, it is trivial, right? The interesting numbers uh, is, um, OK, we have this figure. By the way, this is one of the exercises where you, uh, you can put a rate. You, you put exposure here, which is mass times. And then you can put a limit if you use a nuclear matrix element. And this actually brings me to the exercise number three, OK? Um, so the exercises you can later get the from the transparencies, right? If, if they want to. Um, so this plot that I'm showing you, you here, which by the way, uh, look at the number to get a limit of the order of 20 milli electron volts from an beta beta, which for some nuclear matrix elements is of the order of 10 to the 27 years, you need of the order of of one ton year of exposure. So, uh, I mean, if there would be no backgrounds, that's it's not that scary. I mean, putting 100 kilograms and waiting for 10 years would be kind of not that bad, right? So the numbers uh, wouldn't be that scary in the absence of backgrounds. Um, by the way, you can compute that. And this is the... Uh, this is the goal of the third exercise. Just don't believe what I'm showing. Just do those plots by yourself. And um, it's very easy, actually. All right. The bad news is that, of course, uh, you, you, you have backgrounds. Oh, of course, you have backgrounds. Now, um, let me actually uh, give you some kind of inspirational number. What is the lifetime of the universe, 10 to the 10 years? What is the lifetime of uranium and thorium natural radioactive decay change, 10 to the 10 years? What is the kind of lifetime we are looking for, 10 to the 27 or 10 to the 28 years? How many orders of magnitude? 17. OK, this is what I call the Majorana beach, right? Ask yourself, how many grains of sand do you have in a Beach that has 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18 grams of sand. And it's it comes of the order of 70 kilometers long, one kilometer wide, one kilometer deep. Okay, so now walk your beach for 70 kilometers and find one grain. You get the idea, right? This plot only should be enough for you all to run away uh, to the beach. <laughs> so I like to call this Majorana beach. This is, this is basically uh, one way to put yourself the problem in which uh, you are trying to address. Of course, uh, the, there are many ways, and I'm not going to go in detail because it's many 
But if you're going to do neutrino star beta decay, just become obsessed with radio purity now. Radio purity is everything about the game. And all the experiments, no matter how good they are, no matter how sophisticated the technologies are, all of them are totally doomed to be uh, uh, to be chased by radio purity issues. Any little amount, and we will compare, we will see soon, of radioactivity uh, is enough to make our life extremely complicated. Now, of course, you can measure radioactivity to very, very small quantities with super sophisticated germanium detectors. We, we have heard quite a bit about germanium detectors for searching for neutrino radio decay, but germanium detectors are also extremely good to measure the content of any radioactive substance, right? And the fact that we can make extremely sensitive measurements allow us to quantify the amount of radioactivity that we have in an experiment. I guess that Maura probably also went quite a bit on that last week. So um, now I want to I want to advance. Actually, uh, by the end of my lecture today, I give you a research project, but I want to advance on this. Uh, what I like to propose you, and we'll go more on this, is that we bought, we build toy detectors because my lectures are xenon. We build toy detectors with xenon. Okay. Now, uh, actually, this is going to be all the research project, but let's let's discuss the first part. Uh, build a toy detector uh, and assume that you're going to put your xenon gas somewhere, right? So the most radio pure metal we can use to put our detector is copper. So let's buy, let's go to the shop and buy copper of about three micro becquero per kilogram activity. It's a good shop. It's a very good shop. It's a very, very, very good shop where they electroform uh, the copper. Now I'll come back to that later, but let's take the number. Three microbecker per kilogram. By the way, what do you think about three microbecker per kilogram? Is good, bad, normal? Do you have a feeling of what that means? No feeling. It means hell. We'll come back to that, but it means hell. Uh, three microbecker per kilogram is extreme radio period to the level that you almost cannot measure it with your normal measurement devices like ultra sensitive uh, germanium data. You need to do IGP, GPS. It is it's difficult to measure this already. All right. We know that we can make copper of three microbecker because samples of copper of three microbecker per kilogram have been made. But I'm proposing you that we make a big vessel out of it. Ah, we go to some shop and buy it. Now, um, I'm interested on something like uh, you, we get this activity in bismuth or in thorium. Um, and the first thing I want is just uh, you design two type of detectors. This is, we're going to go a little bit on that. One to contain gas at high pressure and one to contain liquid serum. Gas at high pressure has one density, liquid serum has another density. So of course the vessels will be different inside. We will make the vessels maybe 10 centimeter thick. We could make them 20. But you know, this is interesting. It will not make so much of a difference. Why not? Self-absorption indeed. Copper is not only very radio pure, it's pretty dense. And so if I make 20 centimeters, many of the things on 20 centimeters will not get there. So self-absorption makes that the choice of the thickness is relevant, but not all that. Okay, so we make uh, we make the uh, the this uh, this vessel. We make it ten centimeter in the dimensions. You take the dimensions either to keep gas at twenty bar or to get liquid sinner. You find in the numbers, and you tell me how much activity gets into the sinner. Okay, because we are putting the activity in the copper. The total activity in the copper will translate into a number 
of, of, of some activity for the time being, we're just thinking on activity into the xenon. How much is that under these extremely favorable conditions? It's an interesting exercise. You will see why later. Now, radioactive earth. That's the one thing that this is one of the best kept secrets of the, of the business. Nobody tells you when you get into it that you are trying to make experiments in the wrong planet. We could go to a planet where, you know, thorium and uranium were not all over the place, but they are all over the place. About what? Few grams of uranium and thorium per ton of rock, which means that it's all over the place. And with this level of radioactivity, you have these sophisticated chains that complicate the life of everybody. Now, in the case of xenon, as we will see, xenon is kind of merciful in the sense that you get rid of a lot of this stuff because you are pretty high in beta beta and because you are away from surfaces. But then there is something called, uh, this is, where is it, where is it, where is it? This is thallium, this is bismuth. 2448 KB, 1.6%. Um, remind me what is the endpoint of Sinon? Who knows that? 2458 KB, 10 KB away from here, I have my signal. And 10 KB below, I find a gamma, which has only is only 1.6% of four bismuth 214 decays, which is only 1.6% of my overall radioactivity. Is this bad or good or what? Well, this is a headache. This is this is really bad. And then thorium give me another one, 26115. This is a little bit less bad. We will see how. But to the point I want to go, no matter what I do, I need to live with the fact that nature is putting me a gamma right on top of my signal, okay? And we need to find ways of getting rid of that gamma. Once we understand this in xenon detectors, we understand almost all the name of the game. Now, before we finish, I said before that most neutrino less than beta decay experiments need to live with the fact that your target must be your detector too. So this is the approach of Gerda Legend, Majorana, blah, blah. They say, I want to study germanium and I build a detector of germanium. Uh, Cupid says, I'm gonna do it with molybdenum. A quarter said, I'm going to do it with tellurium. Uh, the xenon detectors, they all do it with xenon. So they all somehow play a compromise between the properties of the isotope. And some of the properties of the isotope are great. Some of them not so great. And what the isotope you can do as a detector. But then you could say, OK, why? What in hell? Let me put the isotope whatever isotope it is, in the middle of my detector, and then build a detector that has nothing to do with the isotope. And that was the approach behind, actually, there was a detector called NEMO detector that did measure the lifetime of the two neutrino mode for many isotopes using that approach. And then there was a proposal for many years, something called Super NEMO that said, okay, uh, fine, let's let's bring this approach to neutrino less than beta decay. So, for instance, I can put a source with whatever element I want. Suppose that I want to study molybdenum. So, I make a thin foil of molybdenum. I put it in the middle of my detector. I put a tracker so that I can see the electrons. I put a calorimeter so that I can measure the energies. I can even put a magnetic field so that I'm sure that I have two electrons. And then here I am. I can now study any isotope that I want, provided that I can put in a thin foil, and I can improve my detector independently of the restrictions 
uh, that the isotope puts. So here is my exercise. Uh, I like you guys to explain the advantages and disadvantages of the technique, and in particular, to give me your estimations with this kind of things, how would you get to 10 to the 27 years in your favorite isotope? Is that clear? So please do think about that. And this, um, and let's move on. So sensitivity. Now, let's do sensitivity in the case of background free. In the case of background free, it's very simple. OK, uh, you just run for some MT. And if after some time T, you have not observed backgrounds, here comes your formula of M beta beta, which simply comes from the formula that we just wrote before, reversing everything and putting one. Now, some of you will ask, why one? Why if I don't observe anything, I should put one? Fine. You have any ideas? Do it. Come, come, come with a reasoning. So why should I say I will serve nothing, but I put one for my limit? Can I do something better than that? Ah, certainly we could. Well, come, come up with a better solution than that. OK? Uh, anyway, if we want to be naive, uh, here's our formula, very simple, right? And actually, uh, we can just plug numbers. By the way, there is a few things. I'm assuming that the mass that I'm putting there is mass of isotope. Do not forget, it was stressed by Ricardo in the previous lecture, I suppose by Maura too, I will stress it too. All the elements that we are using, germanium, it's not germanium, it's germanium 76. And then germanium 76 is seven and a half percent. So you need to enrich your germanium. So hypothesis, our detector is fully enriched germanium. And how did you get that? Because we went to the shop. How much is the cost of gold free? For the time being. Xenon is 10%, Xenon 136. And how did you get that from the shop? And how much is it free? In second lecture, we'll see it's not that free, but it's all right. So let's assume that this is fully enriched. Also, let's assume too, for fun, that the efficiency of the detector is one. Okay, is that true? No, but, but it's interesting to do that. And with this, we can compute sensitivities um, in the case of the free background experiment. And of course, we can also compute sensitivities once we put the background experiments. Now, this is very simple. You just write the background as the product of these quantities. The rate in your region of interest, which by the way, assumes that your region of interest is flat, which by the way, is not true. Your region of interest does not need to have a flat background rate. And we will see that in the case of seeing an experiment, it does not have a, a, a flat background rate. But OK, we can make some kind of approximation there. Times the mass, times the exposure. Now, if you do a couple of simple calculations, you will end up um, having this formula, that your sensitivity for in the presence of backgrounds, please, is the product of something called alpha, alpha square times beta over the efficiency square, all to the one over four power. Now, at this point, you should all be running. You look at this number. Whatever number you manage to get here, then you take the, the square root, and then you take the square root again. And then you call that your sensitivity. Jesus Christ, my Lord. What am I asking you to do? Now, alpha is physics. And notice the physics come with a square. It says there is a competition here between uh, the atomic number of your element and the nuclear matrix element and the phase square square. Notice that the, this is interesting. You would like to have, in order this to be as small as possible, you would like to have this big as possible, the other one as small as possible. But 
typically you're not going to get everything. So this is telling you how much in terms of physics your isotope is offering. Okay. Now you can go and compare all the different isotopes in terms of that number if you want. And that will give you some idea of which one is the one to choose or which one not. The other term beta, which enters only linearly, is a very funny product. Here you have the background rate times the energy resolution, which implies that for a given background rate, if you make the smaller the energy resolution, you win, right? Or you can go the other way around. You can make your energy resolution bigger and then reduce your background rate or both. And the interesting thing is that on the denominator, you have the exposure. So you have the option of duplicating the exposure of reducing by half your energy resolution and the effect is the same. So this is telling you uh, a lot about the different strategies that you can absorb. You can try to maximize this or this or this or all of them at the same time. But notice that they all decouple in a very nice way. And notice that they all give you, no matter what you do, boom, then you are penalized by the square root of the square root. So the alpha term, as I said, is uh, physics. So why not another exercise? Compute the alpha term for the usual suspects. Xenon, tellurium, germanium, and molybdenum, for instance. And tell me which number you get. It's kind of interesting. Okay. The beta term, um, again, it depends on the different strategies. And um, here we can already reflect a little bit looking at the beta term, what the different experiments do in general terms, okay? So all the Germanian experiments are betting on extremely small energy resolution by default. Uh, while the total exposure may not be as large as other approaches because you're putting one little brick under the other, uh, while the C, which is the background rate, everyone tries to keep it small. Certainly, the German experiments have proven that they can keep it very small. Okay, so if you think about approaches, German experiments are offering you the C times delta E, very small. And if you go to the other extreme, Camden's end, in current experiments, C times delta E is not very small because delta E is not very small. We'll see that, that the energy resolution of these calorimeters is 10 times, 20 times bigger than the ones on germanium. But the exposure can be made bigger because they can put, they can just throw, in principle, more xenon gas or more xenon liquid, more xenon whatever than germanium. So the idea is that depending on your experimental technique, it's easier to do one thing or the other. And as usual, you try to achieve compromises between what you have. Uh, but here it comes, I think this is my last transparency for the lecture, the saddest woo of the business. This is the Lolly Heart Club Band, really it's called Lolly Heart because of that. This is a plot from a germanium experiment. Very, I when I saw that plot, I was really shocked. Look at this plot, look at this blue line. This is free experiment, no background. Okay, now suppose that you want to achieve 10 to the 28 years, which is what you want to achieve. Come on, let's be realistic. We want to explore completely the inverse hierarchy and the inverse hierarchy, depending on what the nuclear matrix element is, is already 10 to the 28. So with a totally free experiment, you just kind of, you need like maybe two ton years or something. Fine, two ton years, fine. You put a one ton. This is legend anyway. You put one ton and then you wait for a couple of years. Easy peasy, not a problem. Suppose that you have 0 0.1. 0 0.1, no, no, 0 0.03. Now, 0 0.03, you now wait, what? 
like fine, maybe 10 years, not quite 10 years. All right, why not? We are Prussian people, why not? 0 0.1. Oh, it's getting, it's getting tough, no? Super wife is, we are going, what? Like 20 years or something? <laughs> one event, one event of background. One event of background, where is it here? 100 years? All right, so. Now, one event of background in my full Roy, in a full year from all the background sources, one event of background kills you. You know, this is why I don't need to make sensitivity plots. My sensitivity is better than your sensitivity because the overall universal message is that we are all in trouble, really all in trouble. <laughs> yes, it's desperate, but not serious. See, one event of backgrounds for 10 to the 28 is not admissible, which implies that we want to, okay, let's not get radical, 0 0.1. 0 0.1, it means, first of all, that you need to reduce to absolutely crazy levels. But even worse, how do you measure your background? 0 0.1 coming from 10 different sources means, I don't know, it's 0 0.01 per source. How do you estimate the number? What is your error on 0 0.1? Because if your error on 0 0.1 is 1, you're in trouble. So this, this is the name of the game. This is the reason why you should quit now that, that, that you can, all right? And this is the reason why this business is so beautiful. Because you are trying to make the most difficult experiments ever made. Experiments without background. So everything that the field has been doing has been to, and, and there is some reason for hope. Ricardo show how the Germanian experiments, as time goes by, they keep just reducing and reducing and reducing and reducing the background. So to some extent, we can be optimistic and think, okay, we can keep reducing and then be pessimistic and say, but, but to which factor? One problem that obsesses me of lately is how do you compute the error on your background estimation? How do you know for sure what is it? Because of course, we can always say, I run my Monte Carlo. But I run my Monte Carlo means that my Monte Carlo describes perfectly my, my detector. Or I run a neural network that make that separation between this and that and has this beautiful, but how in hell do you know that you train correctly your neural network? So, these kind of problems are the real kind of problems that the field has to understand backgrounds, okay? So, the, of course, I show you this plot that comes from, from this is a real experiment. It was done by, I think, by legend. And, but you can do this plot actually for all the isotopes. And you can do it, you know, assuming some efficiency. If you want just to be flat, assume one for all of them, just do this, convince yourself, all right? And convince yourself of what kind of numbers we are talking. All right? Uh, is my message clear so far? You all guys now, so you tell me as the last exercise of the day, what are you gonna do after this school? Business school, uh, there, are, there are many options, right? Industry, whatever. Just don't stay. Okay? Fine. Um, so this is the last transparency. How are you going to build the next generation of neutrino less double beta decay experiments? The figure, this figure, disclosure, 
actually, this is the reason that you are here because this is an initiatic school. And when you, you know, it's kind of too late for you to run away, then you are told the best kept, the best kept secret of the field. So reaching a sensitivity of 10 to the 27 requires an exposure of several ton years with a tolerance of about one event of background in their region of interest. The uber secret is that doing the same for 10 to the 28 requires 0.1 background. And the old Spanish window says that the impossible things are those that require a miracle. Uh, and truly impossible things are, are those that cannot even done by miracle. And then there is neutrino residual beta decay searches. All right, so this is the end of the lecture. Um, I have more lectures, don't worry, but let's take a three minutes break, okay?